Welcome to the Victory Church Podcast, your go-to source for weekly encouragement. Connect with us further on social media on both Facebook and Instagram. We hope you enjoy this message and pray that it lifts your spirit for the week ahead. If you'd like to contribute financially to the ministry of Victory Church, visit us at ourvictory.org slash give. All right, we're talking about tipping points. And the understanding, of course, is how using God's wisdom can bring a tipping point to your life and bring you into success, favor, and blessing. Now you, you have it on your, your outlines, correct? The definition of a tipping point. Now, remember what we established last week was a tipping point is not in and of itself accomplished in a moment of time, but the nature of a tipping point is that things are gathering, things are accruing, for a period of time, often unseen, under the surface. And all of a sudden, uh, one little thing happens, seemingly innocuous thing, or how could this be a problem? And that's the thing that puts a situation over the top and causes the tipping point to be arrived at. Now, remember the illustration I gave you last week, which actually was a true story, about this big guy, right? He, he went, I think it was to Italy, and he got invited over a family's home for dinner. You better be prepared to eat when you go there. And they were ready to rumble. And this guy was big, so he went in and he sat on a couch. The meal is still being prepared. And he heard a couple of strange noises in the couch. <laughs> but he ignored it. Then his brother came in, who was equally as large. He sits down on the couch and he heard several more noises that were a little more unsettling. But they didn't think anything of it. They figured, well, in a couple of minutes, we're going to get called into the dining room and eat. Well, one of the guys had a little daughter. I mean, she wasn't tiny, tiny, but she was young. And she came in, sat on her dad's lap, or sat in between them on the couch, and the whole couch collapsed. <laughs> the frame snapped and cracked. <laughs> and it went right down. I mean, that's really a way to make a grand entrance once you've been invited over to someone's house. And so you understand the point there. One guy put stress in the situation. The other guy put a lot more stress in the situation, but it still was able to be maintained by the frame of that couch. But you understand, even though the girl was little, didn't weigh all that much, she brought to bear a tipping point. So understand that good or bad, let's say in that situation, we'll consider that bad. Would you say it's bad? <laughs> because you invite someone over, you pay for all the food, you serve them, and now you have to buy a new couch on top of it <laughs> for your efforts. So, and that's before you fed them. Uh, so you, can, you know, they can't even blame you for feeding them so much. So uh, Anyhow, you see these tipping points can be arrived at in a negative sense. But if we learn how to use God's wisdom on a daily basis, do things his way, guess what's happening? We're accruing good things, and sooner or later, we're going to reach a tipping point of wisdom in our lives where we're not going to have to pray about every little thing. God's wisdom will, be, have, will have a home in our hearts and in our lives. God's wisdom will have renewed our minds and transformed us. And guess what? We are now more on his wavelength than ever before. And when we need wisdom, it's going to be there. Because we've made a habit out of doing things God's way. We've made a habit out of looking at situations, considering decisions that we've got to make, choices that we're making. We've already made the Bible, our guideline, our mile marker. It is so much a part of who we are and how we think that it gets beyond the natural and now we're really living in the Spirit. Amen. And how, much, how many of you know that New Testament living really can be described that way? It's supposed to be a supernatural life lived in the Spirit Amen. and by the direction of the Holy Spirit. To be a Christian in the New Testament and living just a natural life, the only difference being that you own a Bible and your coworker doesn't, that's sad. 
That is sad. Because that is a life lived so far beneath what Jesus purchased for us and what he envisions as the norm for New Testament believers. It's sad. And we, can't, we just can't allow that. So if you've been in that place, the good news is if you still have breath in your body, there's still time to turn things around. So stop the bleeding, right? Stop the downward slide. Stop that. You remember the illustration we saw last week? Start to push that boulder up the hill. Keep on doing it day after day because sooner or later you're going to reach the top of the hill and then you will go into a tipping point where everything will begin to get easier for you because you will have generated godly momentum in your life. How many of you know that when you have a crucial decision to make, you don't always have an hour to pray about it? You don't always have three days to pray about it. It's there. You've got to make a choice. And let's say a person screaming at you, right now, right now, right now. Which one? Left or right? Left or right? Remember that old show, Let's Make a Deal? Which door? One, two, or three? And sometimes you just have to make a choice. But listen, when you have the wisdom of God flowing through you because you've made the Lord the centerpiece of your priorities and your choices in the small things of life that seemingly don't mean all that much. But what you're doing is that you are generating a godly momentum and you will reach a tipping point. Okay, so let's just recap. If you go on your critical observations about wisdom, you remember last week we talked about that first one. It's kind of a metaphorical thing. It's a personification And we'll explain that in just one second and recap. All right, so critical observation number one is that godly wisdom had a supernatural birth. That godly wisdom had a supernatural birth. Right, and we covered that last week. And when you look at that text on your notes, it's a metaphorical kind of thing. And in this case, it's wisdom personified. And I just want to re-explain the first line of this text from Proverbs 8. So it'll be Proverbs 8.22. It says, the Lord, this is wisdom speaking now. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was appointed from eternity from the beginning before the world began. Now, I've got to make this very clear. Because this is a metaphorical thing, it portrays God in this particular translation of bringing forth wisdom But how many of you know that God was never at a point where he didn't have wisdom? (laughs) He is the epitome of wisdom. He is the fountainhead of wisdom. There was never a point where he had to give birth to wisdom. No. The Hebrew word that can be translated brought forth is really the word that means possessed. So if you plug that word in, it's saying... The Lord possessed wisdom, and out of that place of intrinsic possession, he brought forth wisdom as an operative force. And it was first exhibited in creation. Now, the reason why that's important to note is that Jehovah's Witnesses use this text, one of many they use erroneously and as a heresy, and what, they're, what they try and do with this particular text is make it seem like Jesus was given birth to. Jesus was never given birth to. Right. Right. That's right. Only in human form, right, through the Virgin Mary, but that was the plan of God in the earth. But before time began, Jesus always was preexistent with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is not a created being. He's not an angel. He wasn't created by the Father. He always was preexistent with the Father and the Holy Spirit before all things. And you want the text for this? It's John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus. And the Word was with God. That's Jesus. And the Word was God. That's Jesus. So in the beginning, that means before all things, was God. Was the Word, rather. That's Jesus. Jesus is referred to as the Word, right? The Word made flesh. 
The Word was with God. That means, as Paul said in Colossians, that nothing that we've ever seen created was created apart from Christ. And then, of course, the last part of that, John 1, 1, and the Word was God. So that pretty much clears up Jesus being a some kind of created being. Okay? So don't trip over the wording here, because Jehovah's Witnesses are... They, they have their own translation, and it's full of errors. Okay, so let's go to number two. So number one, godly wisdom had a supernatural birth. Number two, true wisdom has always had a true and supreme source. And we talked about that. Of course, that's Jesus. Jesus is the source. The Holy Spirit brings it to bear in our lives, right? The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. He opens the Word of God. He gives us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, all those things. But Jesus is really the source, and there's the text there in your notes. Let's go to number three. The third observation on wisdom that's critical is this. Obeying and applying God's wisdom always brings with it God's rewards. The Lord will always reward people who do things His way, but He will not reward people who don't do things His way. So we got a choice to make. Even as Christians, too many Christians own a Bible but do things according to their own knowledge, their own understanding, their own agenda, their own will. And if somehow the Lord fits into their agenda, fine. And if he doesn't, oh, well. Boy, I don't know where that thinking comes from. But that's not going to lead you anywhere good in the areas in which it would really count. Oh, boy, that's a scary thing. You understand that when, you, when God was dealing with the children of Israel, remember they were wandering through the wilderness? And there were a couple of million knuckleheads. Uh, the Lord would bless them, and then, of course, as soon as they felt like they needed something else, immediately they'd go into rebellion mode, murmuring, griping, grumbling, complaining. They're stiff-necked. They didn't want to do things God's way. They were just ignorant. They were uh, stubborn. And the Lord got so sick of it, he said, you know what? That's it. That's it. I'm finished with this generation. He didn't say I'm finished with the Jewish people or the Hebrews at that point. He said, but I'm finished with this generation. So guess what he did? He took his hands off of them, and sure enough, he let a whole generation die. Wandering, wandering, wandering. Now, where did they get in their wanderings? Nowhere. It's like living your life on a treadmill. Say, well, I did 10 miles today. Well, did you get anywhere? Well, no. How was the scenery? Uh, Pretty much the same. (laughs) Well, that's what they did with their lives. They wandered aimlessly, fruitlessly. They're just wandering. A whole generation, and the Lord said, not one of these people that rebelled is going to enter into the promised land, which today we know to be Israel. The only two people that made it in were Joshua and Caleb. Two faithful servants of the Lord that kept faith and kept their attitudes right. Imagine a whole 40 years of a generation, not one of them gets in. Now here's the point though. The Lord didn't throw the children of Israel away as a people, did he? But here's what God's way is. God's way is this. If I, whatever I can't get from one generation, I'll let them die from my purposes in particular, and I'll go after the next generation. But woe be unto the first generation. So as believers, you see, with Debbie and I, whatever, if the Lord wanted something more from us, and and if we wouldn't let him do it because we wanted a comfortable life and, and you know what, we would only go so far in the ministry and not do this and not do that, and guess what? Then he would say, you know what, then I'm going to cap you off and whatever I can't get from you, then I'm going to let you go the way the grave sooner or later and I'm going to try and get it from your son and from your daughter. But if you say you're through, I'm through too. But then when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, guess what I'm going to have to answer for? 
blown opportunities, squandered opportunities, situations that I just said, I don't want to go any further. We're comfortable. We want to do our 401k trip and retire and do this and do that. No, no, no. No, no. Those words never came out of our mouth and they won't. You know, guess why? We remember David said in Psalm 23, my cup runneth over with blessing, right? And with possibility. Guess how believers should die? Cups empty. It's good to have your cup full. It's good to have your cup running over. But when it comes to the end of your life, that cup better be emptied out in purpose. Because God help you if you die with a full cup. That means you wasted all that potential. No, no. I want to leave it all on the field, not bring half back into the locker room. What about you? See, that's a choice you've got to make. Not once, every day. Or you'll never reach a tipping point where doing things God's way, thinking like he thinks, seeing like he sees, will become a way of life for you. You'll reach a tipping point, and that will all kick in. Until then, you're going to have this constant battle between your ears. But when you finally reach that tipping point, guess what? Man, you're just going to eat and breathe God's ways. So it will always bring God's reward. Look at the text there, Proverbs 4 in your notes. It says, get wisdom and get understanding. Do not forget, again, this is wisdom speaking now. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her. Now look at what wisdom will do for us. The Lord's saying, don't forsake wisdom. She will protect you. Protect you from what? Wrong relationships, wrong choices, goofballs you shouldn't be hanging out with. She will protect you from foolish choices. You know, bridge out signs. She will watch over you. Imagine that. God will, again, if wisdom were personified, God will dispatch his wisdom and say, watch over my son, my daughter. Keep them from their own foolishness at times. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Esteem her. Esteem wisdom. Hold wisdom in high value in your life. And she will exalt you. You lift her up, and she will lift you up. She will exalt you. That means she will line you up for the highest level of purpose that God has for you. Embrace her, and she will what? Honor you. Imagine somebody asking you, man, where did you get that wisdom? You just made a statement. Let's say, where did you get that wisdom? And you say, uh, what did I say? <laughs> and then they read it back to you, and you say, now to you, it didn't seem that monumental. It just didn't seem that monumental. But guess what? Something's flowing through you. It bypasses your intellect in terms of, you know, you're not trying to concoct a particular thought. It just seems like normal to you. Well, this is what you do here. And Pearson goes, oh, man. That's what God's wisdom will do because the wisdom that's in the world is not wisdom at all. It's, other, it's utter foolishness. If the world had any wisdom at all, it wouldn't look the way it does. That, that's just, there, there's the litmus test right there. If it had anything going on at all, it wouldn't be the mess that it is. I'm toying with in the next couple of weeks to show you this little video clip, but I'm toying with it. The outrage of what's being projected onto kindergarten and first grade children in the public schools. This video clip blew my mind. I thought our school system had gotten stupid. This is profoundly more stupid. We're in a race to the bottom right now. 
So we've got to hold on to God's wisdom. And by the way, let me just say this. If you have a child or children in the public school system, you better be on top of that thing every day as to what they're learning. I'm going to say it again. You better be on top of what they're learning every single day. Check their homework. Check their assignments. Check the books that they're being required to read because in many cases, they don't have to read those things because it's gone straight into indoctrination. We've blown past education. It's indoctrination. So just be careful as Christians. You know what? Make your voice known. Put up a stink like the rest of the world is doing. But do it for the right reasons. God's word. The separation of church and state. The freedom of religious beliefs. Don't let them ram things down your throat and down your kid's throat without you having a say in the matter. Don't stand idly by. Well, God is love. Well, that's love. But sometimes love has to get loud. Because this is about the righteousness of God. It's about your kids being hijacked. Doctrinally hijacked. Philosophically hijacked. And bullied. If you don't believe this, you're this. If you don't say that, you're this. I just heard very recently that one particular school system, the teachers are asking the children to all wear rainbow-colored stuff. That's sickening. That's disgusting. That's warped, and it's perverted. No parent, no Christian parent should comply with that idiocy. You want to make a stink? Let's get it on. My, ch- my child will not wear that, and if he or she encounters one bit of discrimination or hassle or, you know, this kind of thing, you're going to hear from my attorney. Listen, we're supposed to walk in love, but we're not called to be doormats. No, don't mistake the two. Ask the Chinese Christians if they'd rather sit under a good government or the government they currently have. Don't tell me it doesn't matter about opening our mouth. Don't tell me it doesn't matter who gets elected to office and the wickedness that brings, as opposed to someone else who wouldn't do that. Don't tell me that. That's the foolish thing to do. Well, Jesus doesn't need protection. Well, he, not, he, not, he may not need protection, but our children do from the wickedness that elected officials bring to bear. <laughs> of course, Jesus doesn't need protection, but our kids do from the wicked. You're kidding me? That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. If you don't believe it, ask the Chinese how much fun it is to live under a wicked government. And what they wouldn't do to get out of that situation and be in a free land. At least free at this point. But the walls are closing in. Right? Why? People ignoring wickedness and not calling it out for what it is. Paul said in Ephesians 3, Have no fellowship, Ephesians 5, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. But rather, expose them. Not only not comply with them, but call it out for what it is. Don't go with the insanity of our age. It's insane. It's a demon spirit of deception that's engulfing our entire culture. You want to know how the end times are going to bring forth a one world order? You're looking at it. Monumental Mass population deception. We're looking at the book of Revelation playing out, setting up. See, it's being set up. Want to know how the battle of Armageddon is going to even come to pass? You're looking at it. You're making and living history. I'm just blowing the trumpet on this thing. 
If that got you mad, you're a fool. Because I'm talking from a Christian standpoint. If that got you upset that I made those statements, you're not even saved. And I'll be bold to say, you're not even saved. You better take a long look in the mirror. Because if God's truth gets you upset, <laughs> guess what spirit you got in you? Here's a clue. It ain't the holy one. That's why the spirit in you is agitated. Instead of saying, right, pastor, right on. You're saying, why is he talking about that stuff? Because every principle of what I just said is in God's word. That's why. <clears throat> you ought to read it sometime. It's interesting. It'll be a whole new trip for you. Let's go to number four. We getting hot now. <laughs> okay, number four. The fourth observation, critical observation on wisdom is this. If you truly desire wisdom, you will acquire wisdom. But there's got to be a profound desire, because wisdom may be stored up for the upright, but it's not given away cheaply. Yeah, make sure that's on 71. It may be free to the upright, but it's not cheap. God's not going to say, well, you know, uh, yeah, you own a Bible. Here you go. I'm going to dump a truckload of wisdom on you. No. No. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 2. I'm sorry. Turn on your devices to chapter 2. <laughs> I'm going to get with the times here. <laughs> Forgive me. Silly me, I own a book. Uh, but, yeah. All right. What, whatever you have in your hand, just turn to Proverbs chapter 2. All right. Chapter 2 of Proverbs. And let's begin at verse 1. Okay, everybody there? Proverbs 2, verse 1 says, My son, look at how iffy this thing gets. If you receive my word in the first place. And if you treasure my commandments within you, not receive them, but treasure them, so that you incline your ear to my wisdom and you apply. That means being diligent to apply your heart to understanding. That means taking wisdom to the next practical level. Yes, uh-oh, here we go again, get niffy. If you cry out for discernment, and if you lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as you would someone telling you there's a deposit of silver in your backyard, but you got to dig it at 3 o'clock in the morning, and if you search for her as you would a hidden treasure in that yard, then you will understand the fear of the Lord, and then you will begin to find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. You see who gives wisdom? The Lord. If he doesn't give it, you ain't getting it. It belongs to him. He never relinquishes control of the revelation behind the wisdom. See, an atheist can read the words that you can read on a page but the spirit of wisdom and revelation behind the understanding of the text only comes from the Holy Spirit. An atheist reads this and said, I don't get it. It means nothing to me. I don't get it. What's the big deal? A believer reads it and said, ah, yeah. Yeah, I get it. Yes, I'm excited. My spirit's full. Because the Lord released it unto you. And you have the right receiver. He's transmitting on a spiritual level. You've got to have a spiritual receiver. Now, it says the Lord gives wisdom. <clears throat> From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. Remember that fictitious warehouse I'm talking about in heaven? He stores up wisdom in a huge warehouse. 
bigger than Amazon. <laughs> For the upright. He's a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of justice. He preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant or becomes pleasant to your soul, then discretion will preserve you and understanding will keep you. Now, how many of you know sometimes that discretion means even though you can say something, doesn't mean you should. And it's that nanosecond where you say, man, I can say this. And the Holy Spirit says, yeah, but do you really want to go there? Are you willing to roll with that statement? Do you really think that what you're going to produce is worth what is going to the blowback? Or maybe I know I'm supposed to say this, but I also know it's not the time. <clears throat> That's part of the reward, guys. Discretion, preserving you, understanding, keeping you from doing stupid things. That's my translation. All right. Now, let's go <clears throat> on the text here. On your notes, you remember the story of Solomon, King Solomon. <clears throat> here he is. He assumes the kingship from his father, David. He's beginning to rule and reign, and he realizes, man, this is a big job. Man, i got to deal with people and problems and the direction of the nation. and oh. So <clears throat> I'm just assuming that at some point he was praying in his own time. That's an assumption, but I think it's, it's, you know, it's well worth within the, well within the parameters of, of uh, good context. Anyhow... <clears throat> The Lord appears to him in a dream, speaks to him in a dream, and said, Solomon, ask me for anything that you want. He's thinking, is he his or her Bentleys? No, I, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Instead, Solomon says, therefore, Lord, give to your servant. That means, please, Lord, give me an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. In other words, give me the wisdom that guides my decisions and lets me see in my judgments the differences between good and evil. He, he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? In other words, it's way above my pay grade right now. The Lord was pleased that Solomon asked for this. So God said to him, Solomon, since you asked for my wisdom... And not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but because you've asked for wisdom in administering justice, in other words, good leadership, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you've not asked for. Boy, that's the double blessing, isn't it? I will give you riches and honor so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among all the kings of the earth. Now, here's a little part that gets iffy. And if you walk and continue to walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life as well. Boy, that's powerful. Now, did Solomon acquire wisdom? Absolutely. He was the wisest man that ever lived. He was the most prosperous man, the most powerful man. I mean, this guy was something else. But why? Because he asked the Lord for wisdom. Wisdom for what? To accomplish purpose, which in this case was leading God's people, leading the nation in a way pleasing to the Lord. Because it came in attachment to executing purpose. The Lord said, I love someone who loves purpose. I love someone who loves me. I love someone who asks for the wisdom to accomplish purpose at the highest level. So I'm going to give it all to you. And then I'm going to give you all these things you'd never asked for. 
Now, the only place where it disconnected was toward the end of Solomon's life. There's a reason why the Lord put that last sentence in there that got a little iffy for him. See, Solomon started out like a ball of fire. But later on, listen to this, when he got wise and powerful and prosperous and this dude was rocking, guess what? He took his eye off the prize. He began to coast. He began to spiritually drift. And his particular downfall was was women. In this sense, that he married women from other nations. The Lord said, if you marry a woman from another culture, she's going to take your heart away from me. Sure enough. And when women took his heart away from the Lord, he lost all that wisdom, he got all messed up. He got so messed up that he actually... Um, allowed shrines to pagan gods to be built right in Israel. How crazy was that? This is the same Solomon whose temple was so filled with the glory of God that the priest couldn't even stand up to dedicate it, minister. Here's a guy that lost the edge. So I'm telling you this, that when he asked the Lord for what he asked the Lord for, he reached a tipping point of having pleased the Lord. And the Lord blessed him with a truckload. But you see, along the way, he didn't continue to fuel the right fire. It's not a one and done situation, guys. Success can be accomplished, but only character can keep you there. Only character can keep you where your gift can take you. That's why some very smart people do some very dumb things once they get successful. Because they have a tremendous charisma, tremendous gifting, tremendous anointing, tremendous ability to, let's say, birth a business or do that. But if they get to the top and there's no character, the fall will be very vast and deep and quick. Because you fall a lot faster than you climb. See, this is not a one and done. Once the Lord begins to bless us, we got to protect that we got to protect that. We have to view that as a divine investment in our lives. What do you think? Why do you think that when we read in Proverbs 2, right in the middle of that whole text I read, he says, if you do this and this and get this and this, then you will begin to understand the fear of the Lord. Well, where's the fear of the Lord have to do with wisdom? Because he understands you can get all this, but if you don't keep your eyes on him, the enemy will seduce you and you'll begin to use wisdom in a shrewd manner instead of a godly manner. I want you to think about Lucifer. Lucifer was blessed with every great thing right around the throne of God. But when he got the boot out of heaven because he rebelled and tried to take God's throne, his wisdom was taken from him, and now his wisdom turned into cunning craftiness. His wisdom was now warped and distorted into shrewdness and cunning craftiness. His beauty was now turned into a hideous, hideous figure that you would envision a hideous demon looking like. When the Bible says Lucifer was glorious in his appearance, just incredibly beautiful, anointed, gifted, and now he's distorted, disfigured, weird, demented, Now, having said that, he lost his anointing, but he retained power. Power means the ability to operate. Now, the context of his power is here in the earth. So he's using his power to make sure that as many people as possible do not tap into God's wisdom so that he can put a hook in their jaw and drag them to hell as a trophy of war, a spoil of war. So it's no joke with him. Jesus said he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He doesn't play games. He doesn't come to party. He doesn't come to have a discussion. If he has a discussion, it's to deceive. John eight forty four. Jesus said when the enemy speaks, when Satan speaks, he speaks from his own nature. 
He's a liar from the beginning. He's a liar now. There's no truth in him. So when he speaks, it's always going to be a lie sprinkled with some circumstantial truth. Which is what familiar spirits do. That's how so many people get deceived at tarot card readers and this kind of thing. The enemy knows that to use a false spirit like that, he's got to bring enough factual things to bear so that the the person that's paid money to go to a tarot card reader gets convinced that, man, no one would have known that about my family tree. No one would have known that. Well, of course they wouldn't. But a familiar spirit has been attached to your family tree long before you ever a thought in your parents' eye. So that's why he's able to bring certain tidbits of information. Because if he couldn't bring anything to bear, who would ever go to a tarot card reader? So you see the second text, Proverbs 8, 17, said, Wisdom, I, wisdom, love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. So there's the promise. There's the deal right there. All right, so did I give you a little shaded box right after that? Yeah, Yeah. God wants to flood you with his wisdom. He wants to flood us with his wisdom. The question is, do we want it today? I mean, it's there. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, but it's not automatically guaranteed that you'll get it just because you're a believer. You've got to take your game to the next level. All right, let's do one thing here, and then we'll quit. So when we talk about apprehending God's wisdom, there are three distinct types of wisdom or expressions of wisdom that I think we need to pay attention to. We'll just do one, and we'll quit. First, directional wisdom. Directional wisdom. Lord, what should I do? Should I take this job? Should I take this apartment? Should it, am I supposed to be with this person? Blah, blah, blah. Now, if you notice this text from James, James 1, the context of this verse, the, the, really the original context was when we're in trials. You know, we count it all joy when we fall into various trials and temptations. And, you know, right? But the, so the context is, and when you don't know how to handle decisions and situations within This season of trials, guess what you should do? If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given unto him, or her, obviously. But here's the deal. When he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. So the first thing, the first expression of wisdom is this directional wisdom. What should we do here? Should we go here left or right kind of thing? And in all the years that I've been serving the Lord, I brought forth six or seven bullet points that are just general characteristics of what I have found God primarily uses. He can use anything he wants, any way he wants. I'm telling you that from the front, on the front end of this. But I'm just giving you my observations after all these years of serving the Lord that when it comes to directional wisdom, this is typically how it flows. It more flows than gets dumped on someone. So let's read it together. That when God wants to give you directional wisdom, it's typically not accompanied by some kind of trumpet blast. Go left. You know, buy that roast and not that one. You know, it's not like that. You mean stop and shop and hear a trumpet? So typically when the Lord's bringing directional wisdom to bear, um, it's not some profound thing on the front end. Let's go on. With growth, remember how I talked about internalizing God's wisdom, making it a flowing part of who we are on a daily basis, when that flow is established in us as a matter of of practice, with growth, you develop an inner sensing. 
So when we talk about directional wisdom, if we're not going to hear a trumpet blast, then what do we go by? There'll be an inner sensing that gets developed, and that typically begins to develop with spiritual growth, and particularly spiritual growth uh, in, in, in terms of understanding God's ways and principles, specifically when it comes to the value of wisdom. Because how many of you know a decision, should I go left or right, is one situation of life. But how about all throughout the course of a day, knowing what to say and what not to say, what to do and what not to do, what thing to lay my hand on, what thing to leave alone, who to hang out with, who to leave alone, what to say to one person. What you know? In other words, it opens the door for the gifts of the Spirit. It opens the door for a flow of a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, Right? And so we want this to be some kind, we want some kind of consistency to be brought to bear. Not, well, yeah, God used me six, I think it was six and a half years ago now. Closer to seven. Let me see. You know, wait a minute. No, longer than that, Nixon was president. You know, so. What is that? Now you're building a shrine to the last time God spoke to you. So you develop an inner sensing. Next, there comes a spiritual stirring. There'll come a stirring in your spirit. Sometimes the Lord won't, he'll, he'll kind of hold back a hunger for something, and all of a sudden he begins to release a fire in an area. Release um, a stirring directionally to go right instead of left. And the whole time, man, I was, I was convinced we were going to go left. There develops, with that stirring, they'll start to settle like a leaf comes down off a tree, an inner sense of knowing what to do. You may be going about, you may be making a cup of coffee during the day, and this thought just comes down like a leaf and settles in your spirit and in your mind. And all of a sudden, what you didn't know five minutes ago, you know now. What, what you were on the fence and a little troubled about yesterday comes down like that leaf and just sit. Whoa, now I'm at peace with this. Next, this direction generally comes to us over a period of time. Remember the whole idea of the tipping point? Lord, what should I do? Listen, you might be praying, Lord, what should I do? And nine months from now, he provides the answer. So don't expect to pray today and answer tomorrow. Don't assume that. You know what happens when you assume? Well, you'll be the recipient of that assumption and the result of that assumptive approach. Understand that generally speaking, when it comes to direction, it will come to bear over a period of time and then what was cloudy and hazy, it's almost like, you know, when you find a foggy morning, and then the summer sun is out there, and the sun begins to beat down, and then the haze dissipates. And all of a sudden, you begin to get clear sight. And then, when you get to the bottom of this list, you see what's also there, because we don't want to ignore this, but we don't want to bank our lives in this. The Lord suddenly has us recognize His circumstantially positioned elements. You know, you turn the corner, you meet this person, you do that, you run into this, you do, you know, right contacts, right places, right timings, right this, right that. But many times, you go past it, you go past it, you go past it, you this, you this, you that, and all of a sudden, he opens our eyes to see a, a providentially appointed set of circumstances in a whole new way. I remember when Pastor Roy, I think, shared this uh, when we did our, I was going to say baby dedication, no, nah, oh. our, our wedding vow renewal, <laughs> baby dedication, I don't know. I'm not prophetic, by the way, so <laughs> our, our wedding vow renewal, I almost said it again, um, so, and he, he was sharing in there how he and Christy met, and way, way back. They were both working in the nursing home ministry. 
week after week, going into the nursing home. Were you, you must have been on the team. Were you guys on the team together? Just, you were on the team, Joe. Going into all the nursing homes, doing what you do in the nursing home ministry. And they did that for a whole period of time. He said, and all of a sudden, one day, they go on the outreach to one of the nursing homes. He looks at Christy. You know, in the movies, when you hear the sound of a harp? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what he heard, but I know. He said, all of a sudden, I saw her in a whole new way. And I said, I like her. Uh, and then apparently the same thing happened to her. So you see what I'm saying? They worked together for a year or two in the nursing home ministry. One day they look at each other and the Lord removes the veil. That's what I'm talking about. A providentially arranged circumstance takes on greater significance when the Lord bring, pulls back the veil. Now what were they doing? Were they on Match.com? Listen, I'm not knocking anyone. All I'm saying is what they were doing was being busy about the Father's business. And the Lord just did his thing. Don't go fishing in the Hudson. And then blame the Hudson. It's only going to produce the nastiness that's in it. And this world is the Hudson. This world is the Hudson. Don't go fishing in there and then blame the Hudson. Don't blame the fish because he's nasty. You fishing from the wrong dock. Now, the last thing I put on my notes that you don't have on yours, we'll finish with this statement, is that when it's all said and done, the Lord, in many cases, uses strategically placed people in your life to confirm a situation to warn about a situation, or to whatever. Um, not just anybody, because I can ask 50 people, you know, what I should wear tomorrow, and I get 51 opinions. That, I appreciate those, but really fundamentally, none of them really matter, except leaders that God sets in my life. Because I can't make an opinion morph into counsel. See, in the Old Testament, the priest had this vest called the ephod, and it had 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And those stones were very carefully crafted, polished, and then set into a setting into that vest. The Lord would use that to give Israel direction when the priest would inquire of the Lord. And you know what? In the New Testament, obviously we have the Holy Spirit in us, we pray and all this kind of stuff. But the set stones in the vests of our life are the spiritual leaders that are set in your life. They don't come across your path, they're supposed to be set in your life like the stone. Amen. Not a tumbleweed, a set stone. You either respect the set stone principle or you're going to wind yourself in trouble. Thank you so much for joining us today. If God has impacted your life through this message, please join Victory in reaching people all around the world by sowing back into the kingdom today. You can give at ourvictory.org slash give or download the Victory Church app and select Give at the bottom. Find Victory Church on social media for bonus teachings and content all throughout the week.